We're in a series of sermons based on Advent, which simply means coming. Uh, during the season of Advent, we celebrate um, the first Advent of Jesus Christ in the form of a little baby in a manger who would then, of course, grow up uh, to live a perfect life, to die a sacrificial death, um, and to be raised with power. But we celebrate that, that time of Christmas, that time of, of the humble condescension of Jesus <clears throat> to become like us, to take form and the shape that uh, you and I know uh, in order to, uh, to live a life uh, ultimately of substitution. Um, last week we acquainted ourselves with a, a very heavy topic. Uh, we talked about how Advent actually begins in darkness. And so we acquainted ourselves with the darkness that characterizes life before the light dawns in hope. And this darkness was so poignantly characterized as aggressive and violent this past Friday. I don't know about you, that, but as I watched those things, I could see the evil that is crouched, uh, postured for our destruction. And this evil was seen in the senseless murders of 26 people, and we know that the majority of them were children, uh, as yet unaware of the full weight of darkness until it would snuff out their lives. As I watched the news, my heart just ached. It just ached. And I think this was a common reaction. Those who were reporting the news could hardly remain professional and objective. They would often have tears streaming down their face as this event, like uh, very few others in recent memory, have uh, brought America, it seems, to its collective knees as we, has, as we have uh, seen uh, the posture of the darkness and we have experienced its uh, massive weight. I lay in bed that night just aching. Dark is the world that we live in. Strong is the bondage to corruption that our world experiences. And agonizing are the cries for restoration in a world of intense suffering. What help? What help do we have to offer those who are saddened by this tragedy during a time of joy? During a season that we know as Advent, the celebration of uh, the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, what help do we have to offer people who are so saddened by this? What help is offered for our own hearts as we are saddened by this tragedy? And, and I don't know if any of you knew any families or anybody who lives there, but whether you did or not, uh, chances are, if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, eagerly awaiting his second coming, then you groaned on the inside as you watched the coverage of that event. So what help do we have to offer? Well, even in this time of darkness, there is hope. There is an extraordinary kind of hope, and most relevantly, the hope that was prophesied in the Old Testament and revealed in Jesus was not a... <coughs> was not a hope that's above suffering. But it was a hope that descended into suffering. It was a hope that would partake in suffering in the way that we understand it as we watch these kinds of events and experience many of them. John Piper, in a blog on Desiring God's blog post, had these things to say. Mass murder is why Jesus came into the world the way that he did. What kind of savior do we need when our hearts are shredded by brutal loss? We need a suffering savior. We need a savior who has tasted the cup of horror that we are being forced to drink. The world needed a suffering sovereign. Mere suffering would not do. Mere sovereignty would not do. The one who is not strong enough to save and the other is not weak enough to sympathize. So he came as who he was, the compassionate king, the crushed conqueror, the lamb-like lion, the suffering sovereign. 
and now he comes to Newtown, Connecticut. Well, after Friday's events at that elementary school in Connecticut, I felt that we needed to be reminded of the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. I felt that we need to be reminded of a God who suffered. My original message was to show uh, the types and shadows and symbols in the Old Testament that are portents or they are uh, 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 um, symbols of Christ who is to come. And that was my original message and so I've sought simply to revise my original thoughts so that I can marry the, um, (coughs) excuse me, to marry Advent's glimpses of hope with the kind of hope we need after the events of Friday. So hopefully my attempts at relevance will serve you and the mission that you and I are called on because aren't we supposed to be uh, lights of hope in this world? Aren't we supposed to be pointing some uh, uh, the people around us who are grieving, who are mourning, who are sorrowful in our own hearts, aren't we supposed to point all of these people to Jesus who is our ultimate hope so hopefully you can be comforted by the fact that we have a savior who is acquainted with sorrows and hopefully you can also be equipped to share with others uh, a savior who can truly truly empathize with our grief so uh, my hope is twofold to comfort your hearts with the promises of advent in the old testament and at the same time uh, to equip you to share this suffering Savior with those who have no frame of reference. They have no ability to understand or comprehend the world of grief and suffering that we live in. So I want to share with you some of these glimpses from the Old Testament. And these glimpses ultimately are only going to come from the book of Genesis. And uh, ultimately just the, the first 15 or so chapters of the book of Genesis and I want us to see some things about our suffering savior the suffering hope first I want you to realize that our hope would receive in his body and his mind the hardest punches that Satan could throw in Genesis chapter 3 right after our first parents fell willingly into sin God pronounces a curse that would include the ruin of the world that you and I now live in When people want to know why are things the way that they are, they are the way that they are because of the curse, the curse that was uttered because of man and woman's willful rebellion against their sovereign king, their refusal to live according to God's plan and their grab uh, instead for some kind of self-styled autonomous living. The curse that was uttered in Genesis chapter 3 also contained a prophecy that yields our greatest Hope that one would come, right? One would come to repair what was broken in the garden. A part of this prophecy says that the serpent who had deceived Eve would also bite our rescuer on his heel. This bite would lay our divine Savior low for three days. But it was the hardest punch the devil could throw. It was the hardest punch the devil could throw to put our Savior, our hope, our light in the ground, but he could only put him there for three days. He could have Jesus mocked, beaten, spat on, only because Jesus would give him this authority. He would tear a son from his mother, inflicting emotional pain as deep as anyone has ever known. Jesus himself watched in agony as his mother was at the foot of the cross, experiencing immense agony, immense pain, watching her own son put to death. But he refused to end it so that he might one day, once and for all, put a complete and final end to all suffering. He chose rather to uh, divest himself of this, rather to rescue himself from this. He chose instead to receive in his body and in his mind the brutality of the sinful planet that you and I now live on. So when we watch the news and we feel the darkness closing in, we can remember that Jesus gave into this darkness. 
Jesus was consumed by this darkness so that light could dawn eternal for those of us who believe. Then, in his resurrection, what does he demonstrate? That suffering has a limit. That the hardest punches Satan can throw can only last for a time for those who believe. God will one day put an end to this suffering in the same way that he raised his own son from death's decay. You know, all of Old Testament prophecy contains promises based on the resurrection. All of the Old Testament promises of of restoration and hope and redemption and life and union with God, all of these prophecies in the Old Testament are based on the fact that Jesus would be raised from the dead and the intense and grievous suffering of this planet would come to an end. You see, Satan can't rob us of resurrection's hope. It doesn't matter how many days in a row we wake up to news that just cripples us. Satan cannot rob us of the resurrection's hope. He cannot extinguish the light that was produced by the resurrection. You see, I believe Satan knows that his time is limited. I believe that he knows what it, what it meant when Jesus came out of the tomb three days later. He knew that his days were numbered. He knew that he'd thrown the hardest punches he could throw, and they were ultimately ineffective. So when we turn on the news today, what we see is a defeated dictator inflicting as much damage and as much suffering as he possibly can on his way to destruction. So when you hear others painfully grieving without hope, introduce them to a Savior who endured suffering so that he could one day free us from it entirely through faith. Second, I want us to Realize the infinite worth of Jesus' suffering. Again, in Genesis chapter 3, Eden's soil would receive the blood of creation for the very first time. God would kill an animal and use its skin to clothe the nakedness of Adam and Eve. They had attempted, right, to clothe themselves through Fig leaves, symbolizing all of our attempts to clothe our shame, to clothe uh, the stain of our guilt, our nakedness. But God would kill an animal in his creation because in order to clothe our shame, death is required. The violence of this animal's killing prefigured the far more violent and brutal death and far more significant death of Jesus. His death would yield clothing for all those who believe. In fact, Luther, one of the Protestant reformers, would talk about um, our union with Christ and, and explain it in terms of what he called the great exchange, whereby we would give off our clothing of sin and shame and guilt. Jesus would wear that on the cross, and he would then offer us the clothing of his perfect life lived in radical obedience to his father and that we could be clothed in the life of christ clothed in the obedience of christ you see the great suffering in our world today is due to the shame of nakedness and all of our attempts to clothe it people are all over everywhere trying to clothe themselves in one way or another reaching for some attempt some hope at Ameliating the, the, the shame that they feel in the world. Adam and, Eve, Adam and Eve sewed fig leaves together, but our attempts to clothe ourselves over the centuries have grown more violent. We try so many things to clothe our shame. But in order to clothe us, Jesus himself would have to be acquainted with our shame and our guilt. In order to clothe us, Jesus would become naked. He would hang on the cross naked for all the world to scorn and mock. Jesus himself would know firsthand the suffering that all of us have known in more poignant ways than we could ever experience. 
He hung there uh, for the mock and mocking and scorning of the whole world on the cross of Calvary. You see, in order to clothe our shame, Jesus would experience the suffering of shame himself. We do not serve a God who is above suffering, but a God who himself came to suffer. So it's good for us to see what Jesus achieved through his suffering. He did not suffer as one who hoped for an uncertain outcome. He would see the travail of his soul, Isaiah 53 says, and be satisfied. Jesus hanging there on the cross, naked, experiencing all the shame and degradation of that, could look and see the clothing of all those who would believe. He could see it and be satisfied. What we're watching week after week, it seems, are the attempts of a shamed and naked planet to clothe itself while Jesus offers the clothing of his very life. So be ready to share this with those who grieve as with no hope. Be ready to share this with those who claim Christ but have not, but have not been equated or acquainted with the implications of the gospel. Our God is a God who suffered. Third, also from Genesis, I want us to understand and realize the nature of Jesus' suffering. Excuse me. In Genesis 6 through 9, we see a familiar story that we read and know of as uh, the story of Noah's Ark. The Ark itself prefigured or symbolized Christ in a very significant way. God told Noah that judgment on sin was coming in the form of a worldwide flood, and he gave him instructions concerning it. His instructions were very, very clear. Salvation from the flood could only be had one way. You had to get in the ark, right? It was in the ark that salvation could be had. Outside was certain death. The flood was itself the judgment of God on a wicked planet whose only thoughts were rebellion continually. Jesus' greatest suffering was for him to experience the flood of God's judgment poured out on himself. He drank the cup of God's wrath and himself experienced the abandonment of his eternal father. In order to carry us through the flood of judgment, Jesus had to drink it. We, and we can't just let it go there that simply that easily. I want you to try to imagine for just a minute. And, and, and it's a struggle for us to try to imagine anything like this. But to imagine the kind of searing suffering within the Trinity when this happened. I don't want us to think that simply Jesus suffered. I want you to understand that the Trinity suffered at the cross. The Trinity is the divine, eternal community of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It is the incomprehensible Christian doctrine of one glorious God simultaneously existing as Father, Son, and Spirit. All loving one another. All deferring to one another. All serving one another. All glorifying one another for all eternity. And then, at a point in time, the Son would be violently torn from His Father and the Spirit. And it's not as if this searing was totally from the outside. Absolutely, Satan did his best with all of his forces. But the greatest suffering was that the father would treat his son as rebellious. That the father would treat his son as insolent. God-haters deserve to be treated. This community that had existed in perfect relationship for all eternity was now suffering so that creation could be could be put back together again 
Jesus would suffer in a way that no part of creation has ever, ever, ever known. But not only that, the Father and the Spirit would suffer the loss of the eternal Son. And even execute punishment on Him that He was undeserving of. So Christ became for us the ark of our salvation. Only through being in Christ could we escape divine retribution. Only through being in Christ could we escape the pouring out of God's wrath on the world. Jesus himself was our shield. Jesus himself was our house, our ark, protecting us from all of that by receiving it in his body. It's only in Christ that we escape this greatest suffering. Jesus was abandoned, so we wouldn't have to be. Jesus was executed, so we could escape execution. No matter the suffering we experience in the world ruined by sin, Jesus offers salvation from the great suffering which is to come. The world has not seen or experienced anything like the judgment that is to come. And Jesus suffered so that we might escape that. And he suffered or he offers it as one who endured suffering to his death, as one who would choose not to. To escape suffering. As one who would choose to be the ark of our salvation. So when you have the opportunity to speak to grieving, sorrowful hearts. Tell them about a Jesus who understands. Tell them about a Jesus who's not above suffering. Tell them about a God who suffered supernatural pain. So that we could one day escape it. Tell this to your own hearts when you're broken beyond repair. Jesus knows. Jesus understands. Jesus suffered. The last thing I want us to look at is the certain result of Jesus' suffering. The certain result of Jesus' suffering. He would accomplish the acceptance of believing sinners. Also in Genesis, God calls Abram an idolater from a family of idolaters. A sinful man to the core, born and in nature of a sinner and by choice a sinner. God chooses to set his love on Abram. God chooses to pour his love out on someone who is completely and totally undeserving. And he tells him that ultimately the promised one will come through his line. Through you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed, he tells Abram. Now at one point, after years have gone by, Abram is desperate for certainty that God will keep his promise. And in order to assure Abram that he will keep his word, he makes a covenant with him. Now, in most ways, the kind of covenant that God makes with Abram and even the the ceremony surrounding it was very, very similar to other covenants that that were common to that era, that time period. But there were some notable differences. First, God causes Abram to fall into a deep sleep so that he gets to watch from a dream state as God cuts a covenant. Abram is entirely passive in all of this, which is unheard of for covenants in that time. Uh, The covenant was between two people who would both bind themselves to the covenant. There would be stipulations on both sides that one is to act like this and the other is to act like this. But Abram would watch as one who is entirely passive as God himself covenanted himself to Abram in an unconditional kind of way. Abram ultimately is not involved. He doesn't sign the covenant. And the second notable difference in covenants of that day, and this this is where it gets strange, as part of this covenant, animals of various kinds are cut in half 
and laid opposite one another. Now, some of the experts in understanding these kinds of covenants will tell you that these animals, as animals as large as a heifer, as large as a goat, as large as a ram, and even pigeons and turtle doves, these animals would be severed, all except the birds. They would be severed, cut in half, and the blood would be everywhere. And they would be laid opposite one another. If you could even look and, and think of the rows that we have here, you could have uh, the severed uh, heifer here, and then the severed ram, and then the severed goat, and they're laying opposite one another. And like I said, blood's everywhere. And, and this became a, a corridor of, of death where these two individuals, those who would sign the covenant, were to walk together through this corridor of death, both uh, saying symbolically that if we do not keep the terms of the covenant, may the fate of these animals be our fate. May we be devastated in this way. May we be killed in this way. May we bleed out in this way. Strange kind of covenant. We don't do that anymore do we when we make promises to one another so this formed a corridor of death symbolizing the kind of grisly end that would come to violators of the covenant but when both parties remember abram in his dream state watching all of this as god cuts this covenant with him as Abraham watches all of these things, and this isn't simply a dream. He did actually take actual animals. He did cut them in half. He only went into the dream state after the cutting of these animals. <coughs> Excuse me. So whenever both parties should have walked through this corridor of death together, Abram watched in his dream state as symbols of God passed through the midst of those severed animals. Abram didn't walk with God. Abram didn't covenant himself with God. This was an unconditional covenant made from God to Abram. So God himself was covenanting with Abram that I will do what I have promised to do on fate of this happening to me if I violate the covenant. So the covenant was cut by God. Now how does this speak of Jesus? Well, we know that God would keep the terms of his covenant. But in order to accept Abraham, and let's remember, remember who Abraham was. He was an idolater from a family of idolaters. He was a sinner by nature and by choice whom God had chosen to set his affections on. So in order for God to accept Abraham, who was a sinner, blood must be shed. Death, like those dealt to the severed animals, was the cost of covenant with a sinner. Not just any death. Not just any blood. Because the blood of animals, Hebrews tells us, can never ever stand in for the guilt of sinners. The blood of animals only symbolized something greater, only symbolized one who would come. So the grisly death of Jesus was prefigured or symbolized by the severed and bloody carcasses of these animals. You see, it's often said that this covenant was unconditional. And that is true in the sense that Abraham did not meet any conditions for this covenant to be made. God, however, did meet a condition. The penalty of death, which was symbolized by these severed animals. God could not pardon Abraham without the penalty of death being paid. And so 1,600 years later, Jesus would be beaten to a bloody pulp. And his blood poured out for Abram's and every other believing sinner's transgressions. Jesus' body would be broken. His blood would be spilled out. The scene of those severed animals was replayed in the bloody cross that Jesus gave himself up on. Our God suffered horribly in order to cut a covenant with us. So again, when you talk about 
those who are struggling to deal with the suffering in this world. Tell them about a God who would suffer immensely just so that he could love us and have us for his own. Tell them about a God who would send his very own son, his only son, into the world to become a man like us so that he could be torn apart for us. I want to close by reading a section from Isaiah 53. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. I think it's going to be on the screen behind me as well. I'm going to read this chapter and then make a few comments. Isaiah 53, beginning in verse 1. Who has believed what he has heard from us, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he, he speaks about the servant to come, the lamb to come, the rescuer to come. For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter. And like a sheep that is before its, that before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the the transgression of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he'd done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he has poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Our God knows suffering. Our God knows suffering. He has suffered for us, and one day, suffering will end. And the great hope that we have in speaking during this Advent season is that we have a hope who has suffered to put an end to suffering one day. It's not here yet, and we groan for it, and we long for it, and we plead for it. It's not here yet, but it is coming. One day every tear will be dried up. One day every broken heart will be mended. One day all of our pain will give way to the greatest revelation the world could ever know. You see, there is a reward. There is a reward for enduring the pain of this world in faith. We will be united with the one who has suffered for us. We will get Jesus. We will behold him face to face and we will be made like him. 
Come, Lord Jesus, quickly to this broken planet. Let's pray.